Good evening all. Hello and welcome. Uh, it's very exciting to have a, a joint IOA and apparently I need to send this off. <laughs> Good evening all. Uh, so yes, it's very exciting to have uh, a joint IOA and AES lecture here tonight. Uh, so, uh, a couple of things first of all, um, we're actually recording this lecture, so at the end when we do our Q&A session, if you could speak into this microphone just for the purpose of, purposes of recording. Um, I'd also uh, like to uh, make a quick announcement about uh, an AES technical visit that's happening on uh, this Thursday. Uh, we're going to see uh, the ATC loudspeaker uh, headquarters and factory over in Stroud. Uh, so it's normally open to AES members only. But uh, if any of you uh, IOA members would like to join us as well, then you would be very welcome. Uh, if you just want to go on to the AES UK website, as-uk.org, there's details there on how to register, and uh, you'd be very welcome to come along, as there are a few places left. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Trevor Cox. So you probably all know who he is. Uh, that's why you're here. Uh, but Trevor's uh, written this, this book, Sonic Wonderland. Uh, he's, of course, uh, a past president of the IOA uh, and does a lot of work with acoustics at the University of Salford. So, uh, yes, with that, over to you, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also need what happened at Salon North, where actually they played uh, a theme tune as I came down. I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, I, I suggested the Rocky music, but maybe that wasn't a good choice. Um, so, we're coming up to summer, aren't we? I'm looking forward, in August, I'm off to Scotland for my holidays, and uh, even though it's raining outside, so maybe Scotland's not such a good choice, it seems. Um, but um, I had this idea a few years ago. If I went on holiday for my ears, where would I go? So if you look at guidebooks, you'll find that there's lots of things about, you know, wonderful, beautiful vistas, wonderful architecture to look at, but most guidebooks have very little about sound. So I had this idea, I set a website up called sonicwonders.org, which gradually morphed into this book called Sonic Wonderland, which came out in, in January this year, which is about the most remarkable sounds in the world. So let me start by giving you an example of a sound which I would call a sonic wonder. And um, you may have heard this one before, so I'll give you a few things to think about. So first of all, if you haven't heard it before, you could think about, well, what is making this mu music? If you've heard it before, you can maybe guess what is the music being played? And if you've heard the music before, you could maybe think, where is the microphone, for those who are uh, audio people in here? And finally, I'd say the music is very out of tune. Any idea what the musical instrument is? Oh, you're very quiet. It's the end of a long day, is it? Gone far away. Shout out. It's a road. It's a road. Yeah, you're allowed to shout. Um, yeah, this is what it looks like. This is a musical road. It's in Lancaster. You may notice from the scenery it's not Lancaster in the UK, <laughs> where it's currently probably raining like it is down here. Uh, this is Lancaster across in California. So it's a road that plays a tune. Anyone recognise the tune? It's the William Tell Overture played very, very badly. So the, the idea behind this road, it was, it was built for an advert, actually, but there's a few out in, uh, there's one in Japan, there's about a dozen in South Korea. It was invented by an engineer as a safety feature. So you're driving along, and it plays a tune at you and keeps drivers awake, or something along those kind of lines. And this is the only one which exists in the West. Um, and it's a very simple kind of way of making sound. You've got a rumble strip, basically. You've got a set of grooves in the road. And every time you hit a groove, you get a vibration in the car body. The time between the hits of the groove, one over that, is the frequency, and that's what plays a note. So if you have the groove spaced far apart, you get a low frequency. If you have them spaced close together, you get a high frequency. So that's the kind of idea. And uh, if those close enough, you can probably see the patches of rumble strip disappearing off into distance. As it says, musical road presented by the city of Lancaster, this lay. Um, now, this was built for an advert, and one of the funny things about this is it's actually very badly out of tune. So for those who didn't quite catch the tune the first time, I'll play it again. And I'll, first of all, what I'll do is I'll play the correct rendition of the William Tell Overture. And it's, it's a terrible MIDI version, I apologise for that in advance. And then I'll play the musical road. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, and this is the road. So it's terribly out of tune. The first note and the last note should be an octave apart. So you should have twice as many grooves in the patch for the highest note compared to the lowest note, and that's not actually what you get. And the funny reason I found out about this road was this blog, which is by David Simmons Duffin, who was actually a PhD student at the time, crossing Harvard, who wrote this called Honda Needs a Tune-Up. You can read it, it's quite amusing, because basically this was built for an advert. And so they did one of these adverts Honda did, aren't we clever people, we can, we're fun engineers, we can make musical roads, and it's, isn't this lovely, and aren't we really very clever? And they built it wrong. Uh, they got the groove spacing wrong, and you can, there's a description of, he's not quite right in how it's wrong, but he's definitely right, it's wrong and very badly out of tune. So what do you think Honda did to save the day when they actually broadcast the advert? Auto-tune. Auto-tune. So anyone in the audio industry, you can always auto-tune. So if you listen to the advert, you'll notice they take the last, the top note, and they just pitch it up a bit so it doesn't sound quite so bad. The rest of them kind of fall into musical intervals. But the, what, the last one is wrong. Now, there's this kind of description, and, and if you read it, it talks about Honda's had all sorts of excuses as to why actually it wasn't the road, there was something about the driving and all that. Well, when I went along, I took a tape measure so I could actually work out who was right and who was wrong. Um, so I stood by the road and recorded it, and I'm in the car as well. And just to prove it's flat, um, this is the correct frequency in the tune. So this is an octave from the bottom to the top note. And this is actually the frequency if you just do a pitch analysis of that audio file. And you'll notice if you set the first note to be a particular frequency, all the higher notes are flat. And uh, it doesn't matter if you drive faster, they'll all still be flat because pitch is all relative. So it'll, it doesn't matter if you speed up or slow down. You could drive very fast and brake fast, brake fast, brake, and maybe you'd be able to get it in tune, which is, uh, so, you know, I knew it was constant speed. The reason I put cruise control on and kept absolutely constant speed and recorded it several times. So Honda claimed there was something odd going on in the groove. So I got my tape measure out and by the side of the road, I measured the groove and the groove spacing. So we're all in acoustics and audio here, so we all know it's all to do with the distance between periodic bits, 12 centimetres marked up there. It's, you know, that's the, how often you get a kick, an impulse, and therefore one over the time it takes to go those 12 centimetres is the frequency. And so I measured all the grooves and I plotted the frequencies you'd expect just by knowing the car speed and also the frequencies from the audio recording. And you'll see they're exactly the same. There's nothing funny going along, going on this. It really is an impulse every time you hit a groove on this road. So Honda just got it and, and actually, uh, unfortunately, made it the wrong size. Now, the funny thing about the musical road in Lancaster is that's not the first version. Honda built it, and when they first built it, they built it near uh, a set of houses. Now, it's great fun in the car, and as people drive past, they smile a lot as they go past. Can you imagine living in a house nearby? Because, of course, its body, you know, anyone here who's in, in auto uh, uh, acoustics will know its, its vibrations of the body work is basically what you're listening to. Um, and uh, therefore, what you get is you get various renditions going past all through the night at different pitches, because it depends on how fast you're going. And you also get a spectacular Doppler effect. So it goes, dee 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 Because the, the actual source is the car, and it's moving. And therefore, you get most tremendous Doppler uh, recordings. Unfortunately, I haven't got any which are any good, because it was very high wind, and um, I didn't have a windshield. I, I borrowed a, 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 mic, a microphone from a Hollywood uh, sound artist, and he didn't have a windshield, so I couldn't get a good recording. Um, so they had to move it. And when the city of Lancaster rebuilt it, out near a military depot, so it was no problem to anyone, they still built it wrong a second time. They didn't retune it, they got it wrong. So where do you think the microphone was? Where's the best place to record a musical road? Did someone say glove box? So glove box is actually where it was. I wanted to get rid of the wind noise, so I stuck it in the glove box, I stuck it in the trunk, I stuck it in lots of places. But I can tell you, if you want to make a recording there, the best recordings were in the glove box of the car, if you ever, ever go over and have fun. So... That's an example of a sonic wonder which, you know, there's no visual charms to that at all. It's a road, it's a dual carriageway. It's not very nice to look at particularly, but it's got some oral charm to it. But it doesn't really appear in many guidebooks. You only really know about it by sort of kind of word of mouth. So that was kind of sort of thing I was trying to collect together with sound tourism. But there's some other sort of bigger messages that I give in the book, and that's to do with how we ought to be listening more. 
and we should be less visually dominated, we should be listening to our everyday life more. And I'll give you a good example of a place, a tourist site that lots of people go to, where listening, I think, is very important. And that's anywhere with ancient or prehistoric sites. So, anyone been to the new Stonehenge Visitor Centre yet? Which is kind of controversial, apparently. I don't know. So, Stonehenge, um, it's very easy to go to a place like this and look at it and go, wow, how did they get the stones there? How did they put them up? They actually put a lot of them back up again in the early 20th century. How did they actually get them up there? Why did they put it there? Why is it orientated? But actually, prehistoric people, we should be thinking about what did it sound like? So you go back a few thousand BC when, uh, uh, when Stonehenge was in its use. There was no writing, so if you want to pass information from person to person, you're going to do that orally is one of the ways you're going to do it. Um, and also, if you look at primitive societies in the world, they tend to have a much more imbalance of their senses. Sound is much more important to them than it is maybe to us in, in, in our modern world where we've all got pieces of paper we're printing on it, we all spend time looking at computer screens, and we're doing a lot, a lot of things visually nowadays. So there's an argument to be said that the acoustics of these spaces would have been rather important. And we don't know exactly what Stonehenge was used for. There's lots of debate about it. But one thing we do know is it was probably used for some rituals. And if you think of any rituals we have, whether it's a wedding, a, uh, a funeral, you know, uh, whatever, it involves some form of sound, usually. We, we, we usually make music. We sing. We, we have someone like me talking at you. So we have all sorts of sound going on. So the sound inside this place was probably important because the chances are there was ritual going on inside. But what was the acoustics like? Well, if you want to know the acoustics of the place, there's no point going to this particular site. It's marvellous to go for for other reasons. And the reason is, this picture looks marvellous and complete, but you go to the other side and most of the stones are missing. And the acoustic character of this site is very different to what it would have been in ancient times. And there have been people who have gone and done studies, who have gone and studied this acoustics of this, and said, oh, it's marvellous, it's got these acoustic effects. There would be nothing like what it would have been if you'd gone back a few thousand BC. So what do you do if you want to actually find out what Stonehenge is like is you need to go across the Atlantic to the west coast of America and visit the Mary Hill Stonehenge, which is a complete concrete replica of Stonehenge. It's to scale, uh, it's a one-to-one -one scale model of, and it was built as a World War I monument to the fallen heroes of, uh, of the county. Um, it's a pretty good replica of Stonehenge. Okay, it's concrete, not stone. That's probably not quite that, that important, really. It's a bit crinkly, a bit more than Stonehenge's, but actually it's the size of the blocks which are really important. And um, unfortunately, I hadn't had to do the acoustics research behind this because two people, Bruno Fazenda and Rupert Till, went out and measured this. And they've given me some sound files to illustrate what it would have sounded like. So what would the inside of Stonehenge sound like? Well, I'm going to play you two files. The first one's going to be a dry recording of just some, some singing. And the second one's going to be the recording with the stones around. And I guess you probably, in the audience, you probably know what to expect. But the, the things you might listen out for is a change of volume level and also a change in timbre. It's like you're going to the bathroom and having a sing. You'll suddenly find the timbre changes. So let's try the dry acoustic first. Oh, my hat is frozen to my head. My feet are like two lumps of lead. I'm stuck out here, half drenched, half dead, from standing under your window. Oh, let me in, the soldier cried. Cold, hailing, windy night, let me in. The soldier cried, or I'll not come back again. No. Oh, my father, he watches. And then with the stones. Oh, my hat is frozen to my head. My feet are like two lumps of lead. I'm stuck out here, half drenched, half dead, from standing under your window. Oh, let me in the sun. Well, just above the air conditioning, you probably notice it's a bit, quite, a bit noisier. And also you could hear, hear timbre change, you could hear that it sounded, you know, a room effect. And actually it's got a reverberation time which is quite long, even though as you can see there's a lot of sky because the sound stays in a horizontal plane quite a long time. So the reverberant's quite quiet, but it actually could last quite a, quite a lot, surprisingly long time, which makes it quite good for ritual. Bruno, who's actually been there, I've not been to this site, says you can stand behind the stone and have a conversation with someone elsewhere because the reflections help you to have that conversation. 
And a lot of the debate in archaeoacoustics is, well, was the acoustics of this ever deliberately designed? That's one of the big arguments about intent and acoustics. Um, I, my personal feeling is I suspect that it's, you know, it's probably not intentionally designed, but given it's got good acoustics for speaking in, it would be surprising if we didn't exploit that fact once it was built. That was my personal take on it. And in the book, I go through the different evidence that people have looked at in archaeology. So that's a, a sort of old site. And I was thinking when I was writing this book, what would be a, a site which has equivalent surprise to our modern ears? So that Tombra change is not surprising. We're in a room here, we go outside, we've got reflections from buildings, reflections from the road. We're used to hearing lots of reflections and Tombra changes and coloration all the time. Where would be somewhere surprising? Well, I'll give you two examples. And you have to go to some unusual places. And the first one that some of you have been into that's an anechoic chamber. I guess a lot of you, maybe not everyone in the room, has been in an anechoic chamber sometime in their life. That's got a really surprising acoustic. Now, most people talk about the silence in there being a very quiet place. You know, does it give you hallucinations? You know, that, that, that um, article by the scientists in UCL about it giving people hallucinations. But actually, one of the unusual things about this place is how dead it is. And I can illustrate that, and it's a good illustration to use this. It can be very quiet. You have to listen carefully. This is what a gunshot sounds like in an anechoic chamber. I don't know if you've ever done this, but you, when you record it, it will be like, oh, did I actually get that right? I better go and re-record it. So here's three gunshots in the anechoic. <laughs> They're just clicks. So when you record it, you go and do it again because you, you're sure you've got it wrong. So there's a space. I'm not going to talk much about it because I think most people will be familiar with anechoic chambers. Therefore, I don't think for us it's so surprising. But what other architecturally surprising spaces? So this is a really unusual building. What one might be more open to the public and generally available? Well, you want a really odd geometry. And the oddest geometry I can think of for acoustic effects is a spherical room. So on the top of here, you can see a spherical dome. And that is almost a completely spherical room. It's about three quarters of a sphere. And they have really peculiar acoustics. This particular site here is across in Berlin. You can go and visit as a tourist. It's Tufelsberg, which is called Devil's Mountain. So at the end of World War II, they had huge amounts of rubble. Berlin, Western Berlin was blockaded. What did they do with the rubble? They built a big hill. And then the Brits and uh, the Americans wanted to spy on the east, so they built a listening station on this. So this is a Cold War listening station. Um, so what used to be in these ray domes were antennae to pick up radio signals, television signals and the such like, so we could spy on East Germany and Russia and Czechoslovakia and other bits of the East to see what was going on. So these radomes have got no acoustic purpose whatsoever. Uh, they're there to protect the antennae from weather, protect it from wind, so the, the, the uh, East Germans didn't know which way the antennae were pointing at any one moment, that kind of stuff. Um, so, and you might have seen that, I suppose in Britain we used to see them in Filingdales, up the golf balls up in Yorkshire and Filingdales. I think they've gone now, there's a different shape now, but they used to be there. So we've, they're not unusual, but they have very unusual acoustics. And the best one is the top one. You can see this one's very damaged. Um, if you do visit, one thing you need to be warned is don't go if you're scared of heights. Because you'll notice this tower, which is five, six stories tall, none of the walls actually exist. And actually, although it looks like a complete dome at the top, there's actually one panel missing. And you look out and there's just a sheer drop down to the forest below. So you have to sign when you go in an affidavit to say, if you fall off the edge, it's your fault. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not very safe, unless you're... Unless you're uh, but if you're not stupid, you should be OK. So, um, what does it sound like in there? Well, because it's a sphere, you get a very strong focusing effect. So what I did is I jumped onto the middle of the plinth, where you can still see the bolts where the antenna used to be, and that was right in the middle of the ray dome and I burst a balloon. I spend a lot of time carrying balloons around and bursting them. And what you get is the sound comes out, it gets focused by the dome, back again, goes out to the dome, focused, out again, focused. You get a ricocheting reflection and a ricocheting echo, and this is what it sounds like. I'll play it again because it's quite quiet in here. So every chicka 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 is another reflection. If, it's loud, if, you, if you play it in a quiet room, you'll hear five, six, seven of those effects. Oh, we'll have another one. Um, so you've got a very strong focusing effect, and that creates... Oh, shut up. <laughs> that creates some weird effects. One of the weirdest effects you get was described in... Do you I don't remember a yellow book called Kramer, Muller and Schultz? The yellow books and principles of... Uh, who's old and can remember those books? In there, he describes going into a room where you can whisper into your own, rear, uh, into your own ear, and you can do that in this spherical room. What did I say? Yeah? Yeah. Um, what you do is you stand right in the middle at the focal point, and so all the sound comes straight back to you, and all you have to do is lean to the side to get the focal point right at your ear, and then you can whisper to yourself, which is kind of peculiar. The other kind of effect, which you, you know, I tried recording that, it just sounds 
it just sounds like someone whispering. So the, my recordings are pointless, so I'd never play them. The other one is when I leant down to get the recorder out of my bag, I unzipped it and it sounded like I was unzipping it from above my head. The precedence effect is overcome very, very easily by this very strong reflection, which you don't often get in an acoustic space. So there's some really odd places, like spherical rooms, worth looking at, but you don't have to go that far to find a spherical room or something with an odd acoustic. You can find them a space up in Manchester, it's not quite a sphere, which has also got astonishing acoustics, and uh, it's in a car park. So this is a, I don't know if many people know Manchester, but Castlefield, where the Museum of Science and Industry is, the heart of the Industrial Revolution, there's a canal basin down there where the Bridgewater Canal starts, um, if you don't know, it doesn't matter particularly. Um, but this is, an, this is a car park normally. It's normally got cars in it. Um, and it's got this amazing brick arch. And the focal point of the arch is right on the floor. So you get the same effect where the sound keeps going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between these arches. And you can see me. This is a, a sound walk I did for the uh, Manchester Science Festival. So these are, these are various people with me walking around, blowing up balloons and bursting them and talking about the acoustics of these places. And uh, I'll play you an example of it. And uh, here's the impulse response on a balloon. So you can see each individual focused reflection. So you can actually see there's about 10 of those there, which are very clearly heard. And this is what the balloon burst sounds like. I think there's three of these, if I remember rightly. So all those ricochets you're hearing are this focused reflection going back and forth. There's lots of arches under there, some great acoustics under those places, but you have to find just the right one where the focal point is just at the right point. I also played the saxophone there um, uh, to, to do it, and it's quite interesting playing the saxophone because these reflections are so strong, it's quite hard to play because you get put off by these reflections. You know, have you ever done that one where you have the sound of your voice relayed with a little delay into your ear? It's a bit like that. It's very off-putting. But here's a short section. I only play a bit of it of me playing saxophone. And when you get to the slightly faster bit, it'll sound like two people are playing. Well, it's only just me. It's just a reflection that you're hearing. knows a piece, I paid an extra arpeggio, which wasn't needed. Anyway, so you heard that ringing sound, we'll hear an even more dramatic effect like that a bit later on when I take you to somewhere else. But you get this really weird, it's a really weird place to play, and it's got a really strange acoustic to it. Now I started looking at bridge arches because of a really old paper in the, a paper in the Journal of Acoustic Society of America. And here's the paper, you don't have to read it, don't worry, I'm not going to ask questions about it. But this is back in 1948, there's a couple around this page about a place called Echo Bridge. And uh, you can see the kind of shape of it there. And the question about this was, how does this create an echo? So this is actually one of the rare examples of a tourist site, which also appears in the scientific literature, and it's all about acoustics. Um, the, the debate here was, if you, there's a little platform, we'll see it in a moment. If you make sound, does the sound go across here and bounce across the surface of the water, or does it skim around the inside like a whispering arch effect? Which of the effects is creating the echo? It might be even more obvious if I show you the picture of it. So this is a platform, when you make a noise on it, does the sound bounce straight across the water, or does it go around the arch like a, a whispering gallery? Have you been to St Paul's Cathedral Whispering Gallery? People there, where the sound sticks to the inside of the arch, a whispering gallery effect. Um, and um, this platform is purely here for acoustic reasons. It goes absolutely nowhere. They rebuilt it recently as a sort of, kind of, uh, a sort of listening platform. So there we go, that's a really rare example. We're used to having you know, viewing platforms. This is one of the rare examples of a listening platform that I found. And what people like to do is go and play there, you go on YouTube, you'll find lots of videos. The other thing people seem to take videos of is taking their dog here and driving them mad as they listen to the as bark and think it's another dog. And so here's a dog barking.
It's okay. It's all right, baby. You good boy. There's really nobody there. What? It's Dunkley. So there, there's lots of videos of those. <laughs> Should we leave the dogs suffering in silence? Um, so this is, a, I should have said this across in America, so I'm afraid you can't take your dog, it's not, it's not nearby unless uh, you're great. It's in Massachusetts. Um, but it's vis very much visitable. So back in the 1948, they tried various attempts to try and measure it, and there was a couple of letters to the editor, and basically they said they don't know kind of what's going on. They tried putting people in the middle, counting the reflection time. They tried trying to kind of block out this archway path with blankets and the wind blew it out of the way. There's also a kind of description of them failing basically to work it out. But what do we have in modern day acoustics? And what, what I found quite a lot right in the book is I had to apply modern tools to understand what's going on. So you write these books about these great sites and of course no one's really written much about them and you're faced here having to describe it in a book. Well you have to have the, you know, what's going on. You have to know what's going on before you can write about it. So fortunately, nowadays, we have lots of sophisticated prediction models available, which we didn't have back in 1948. And this is actually a finite difference time domain prediction. John Schieffer, who's now across in Israel, but was a student of ours, very kindly made this for us. So what you're going to see is you're going to see the waves created over here. And the question is, does the sound skim around the inside of the arch, or does it stay across the bottom of the water? So there's the sound wave going out. I'm not sure what that second one is, whether it's just an artifact of the modelling. So you can see some of the sound is coming back across the water, and some of the sound is going around the arch. So the, possibly the reason they struggled to work it out many years ago is because actually both mechanisms are in play. So that's probably why they had a bit of a struggle to work out what's going on. The exact arrival time of these depends on the size of the arch, the tilt of this bit on the other side. And, I mean, I haven't been to the bridge, I haven't measured it. I tried measuring off um, pictures in Flickr, so I got a rough shape, and I tried to get off that jar as a picture, but it's only very approximate. So we can't be certain, but certainly there's mechanisms where sound can go straight along the bottom and straight around the arch as well, like a whispering gallery. But if you want to experience this effect, Echo Bridge is not that unusual. So it's unusual because it's in Jaza, which is obviously very rare. It's unusual because it's got a listening platform, which is incredibly rare. But you can find brick arches all over the place which have this property. And so here is one. This is Castlefield again. So if anyone knows Castlefield, you might be able to recognise where we are. Um, so this has exactly the same physical properties. Uh, and it's just down near uh, the YMCA, so kind of that direction for those who know Manchester. You stand on here you'll find that sound will skim around the top and it will also bounce off the power pit and come back at you. And I'll, I can play you what it sounds like, because um, I've been there and I burst a balloon. The people in this canal boat were very friendly, they didn't mind me doing this, so they did come out to find out what was going on, uh, but they were quite friendly about it. And again you'll hear a ricocheting effect, and again it's, uh, each, each time you hear something is when the sound's gone over the other side and come back again. That didn't work well, did it? Do another one. Can you hear those? Just, uh, it's quite quiet in here. The middle balloon didn't burst very well. That's the thing with the middle balloons, a bit un uh, unpredictable. Uh, if you want to see what it looks like, then that's actually what it, the impulse response looks like. So pressure versus time. So you can see each individual sort of trip over. It's got a delay, if I remember, about 0.2 seconds. It's quite weird to play in front of. I don't, it's like a real strong slapback echo you might put on a music recording, like, I don't know, Elvis used to use back in some record days. It's that really strong double reflection kind of effect that you get, you used, to use, used to use in music production back in the 1950s. If you can't see them there, we can put it in decibels, and you can more clearly see all of these different arrivals across the, uh, the, uh, across the place. So it's not an unusual place, an unusual effect, but it's not very often documented. That You can go and find archways, they have this kind of property. And there's one other effect in the spherical room which is really worth doing. And um, when I went there, I was taken around by a guide who was telling me all the history, and he didn't know this effect existed, and that's a whispering gallery effect. So I've mentioned St Paul's Cathedral. For those who don't know, that didn't mean anything to you. If you're inside a dome, sound, if you go and talk into the wall, the sound will tend to skim around the inside of the wall. It's a whispering gallery effect. You can look at Lord Rayleigh's description of it back from 100 odd years ago. Um, it's really just, you can think of it as a geometry thing. If I was to make a, 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 a circular snooker table, 
and I was to send the white ball off at an angle right close to the walls, it would, wouldn't go into the middle, it just stays around the edge. It's an angle of incidence, angles of reflection kind of thing. It just is a, it's a geometry thing. Um, if you really want to get uh, more complicated, you can do it in Bessel functions as well, but it's easy just doing ray tracing. And you can get the same effect in here. So I put my record on one side of the wall, there happened to be something sticking out the wall I could prop it on, and I went to the other side and burst a balloon. And the great thing about going to this place for a whispering gallery is you go to St Paul's, I can't burst a balloon for obvious reasons, I don't think I'd last there before I get thrown out very quickly, but here I can make a lot of noise, and if you make a lot of noise what happens is you get many laps. So you'll hear a ricocheting sound and each one is a complete lap as the sound goes around the inside doing laps of the place. So here's a burst balloon showing the whispering gallery effect in here. So each judder you're hearing is another trip around. So you get this juddering effect, which is the whispering gallery effect. Musicians like to go and play in here. You'll find YouTube videos of this as well. Now, there's another effect on this, and I thought you had, when I, uh, I didn't have a, a great picture of the arch, but there's another arch in Castleville, which is just here. It looks like this one that's a bit narrow and a bit taller. So it's quite a narrow brick arch, quite a tall brick arch. This is the only picture I happen to have of it when I was putting the talk together. Um, and this is, this, the photographer, these vegetables were out for a different reason. They're, not, they're nothing to do <laughs> at all with me. This is this, this going around Manchester Science Festival. Um, they were doing a canal thing and they had loads of vegetables out for some reason. The photographer thought they put it in the foreground. Um, but what's remarkable about this arch is it has the most tremendous reverberation. Really surprising. I walked underneath it chatting to a friend one day and it's like, wow, God. The reverberance in there is really, really magnificent. And I'll show you the reverberation time curve, uh, and that's what it looks like. So we're talking about reverberation times about four seconds under this arch. It's just kind of like you'll look there and you'll go, why is that doing it? Some quirk of the geometry, it must be very well made and walls very parallel, gives you very, very long reverberation times. Um, and I'll, a little, I'll leave you with a question which I've not got a full answer to. Why is the reverberation time halved at 2,000 hertz? It's a genuine measurement. If you go and look at the measurements, you'll see it dies away much quicker in that particular frequency range. And I haven't got an answer. I'd love to know someone who can answer it for me. So I'd leave that as a challenge to the acousticians in the room. I suspect it's something to do with the fact it's made out of a lot of little bricks, and those bricks happen to be spaced where Land upon 2, 2,000 hertz, is the brick width. So there's something about the size of the brick, I think, but I'm not quite sure and I can't be able to work out in my own mind and I've not gone down and done any serious measurements beyond bursting a balloon in there. But reverberance is really interesting and actually the first chapter of my book is all about reverberation because, you know, it's where sort of architectural acoustics started, wasn't it, back in uh, Sabine, back in, in Harvard. And um, so I, I went actually, and actually Bridget was there, who, who went to the Glasgow Mausoleum a couple of years ago? Keith was there, two people were there with me. Uh, there's the Glasgow Mausoleum. That used to hold the world record for the, for the uh, longest echo. And uh, if you read the description, of, go back to a Guinness Book of Records from about 10 years ago, it'll say when the big brass doors were slammed shut, the sound lasted for 15 seconds before dying away to nothing. Now, as we did acoustic measurements in there, I don't know Keith and Bridget may not remember what they exactly were, but actually the reverberation time mid frinks is about 10 seconds. Um, and actually when we're there, it's quite impressive, but it's, not, it's like a reverberation chamber. It's not... It's not, you know, it's not unusual. So when I went to that place, it kind of made me think, well, there must be more reverberant places than this, because this isn't actually much more reverberant than, say, St. Paul's Cathedral. And so I went on the hunt to try and look for the most reverberant place in the world. And um, I went to various places. Uh, I didn't go to this one, but I went to a place which was very similar. And when we were doing the AGM, for those who are in the room, this pit, there was a picture very much like this of Wormit Water Reservoir up. This happens to be the American Water Reservoir, which looks really similar. So this used to hold two million gallons of water. It's across in the west coast of America. I've not visited it, but it's quite famous. Artists go and play in this. And uh, there's one in Wormit which artists don't generally play in, which I found out about because there had been one concert in it, which used to hold one and a half million gallons, so it's not quite as big, but it's similarly very reverberant. And one of the interesting things when artists go into these very reverberant spaces is how do they play, you know, what do they do musically with these spaces? Because the sound lasts so long, it's, it's nothing like a console. So what do you do? There's two kind of solutions I'm going to play you. The first, if I remember the order right, is Stuart Dempster. So Stuart Dempster is a, um, a trombonist from America and, uh, he, and didgeridoo player. And he's got a, a, a record called Un 
underground overlays from the Sistine Chapel. You can download it from your, your download store. I have a copy of it. And I'm going to play a little piece of him playing in this place with a couple of his students. If the sound, if notes are going to last 10, 20 seconds before dying away, one thing you can do is just play very slowly and you end up with sort of whale song, meditative kind of sounds. And that's the kind of thing that, that Stuart Dempster does with his students. It's quite mean, I only give about three notes, but it keeps going. It keeps, goes on for quite a long time, even with three notes. So that's one way of playing, is to play very slowly and just slow your music down to something very, very slow. The other way to do it uh, is to actually ignore the fact that it's reverberant and just keep putting more notes on top of each other. And that's what John Butcher, who's a, a Brighton-based uh, saxophonist, did in the Wormit water reservoir. So it's not this water reservoir, it's the other one. It's, it actually plays very fast. And you can actually play fast against this. And this is what organ music does. So if you go into a cathedral, one of the techniques in organ music is you can play quite fast and you get this build-up of past notes, but you can keep layering on top of new notes, which kind of harmonise with the previous ones or just almost ignore the previous ones. And this is what John Butcher does, and this, which is called uh, Calls from a Rusty Cage. Again, available from all good, sh all good music stores. When I visited Wormit, it's actually in, the, in someone's back garden, you know, it's an architect's back garden, it took quite a lot, lot of effort to find out who it was. I, I talked to the, the, the husband and wife who were the architect firm showed me round, and the husband said, oh, it's brilliant when John Butcher came, and the wife said it was unlistenable to. So I think you can get a sense of different musical taste with that. But anyway, that's uh, John Butcher playing. So it's quite interesting, musically, how people deal with that space. Um, but that's not the most reverberant space that I visited or know about, and as, as some of you already know. Uh, the most reverberant place that I went, which features in the book, is the Inch and Down Oil Depot. So this is um, actually up in Scotland, and I actually visited it again for the second time ten days ago. So I'm actually going to play you some saxophone music in there, because I took my saxophone to it the Saturday before last. Um, so the first thing about this Inch and Down Oil Depot is it, is it didn't, doesn't have any doors on it. So you don't get into it for a door. It was never intended that, you would, um, that, that people go in it apart from for maintenance. So the only way through is through the ventilation and maintenance tunnels, which are tubes. So this is the entrance to the Inch and Down oil depot to actually get into the tank. To give you a sense of scale, it's about that narrow. The sound, the sound engineer who came, turned up uh, Saturday before last was really big. And they had to push him really hard to get him through. <laughs> it was, there was a moment of, will he get through? And uh, if you push hard enough and scrunch up, it, you, you will get through. You lay down on this trolley, which is a bit longer than it looks, about four foot long, and you get put in like a pizza going into the oven. Um, so it's, it's quite, a, quite an entrance. And actually, I met someone. Um, the, it's, quite, you had, it's, it's not open to the public generally, because it's not very safe to go in there with lots of people. And actually, one of the people I met again, who I'd met last year, was the person who got halfway down the tunnel and said, no, pull me out again. And so he never got in the tank, because he was so claustrophobic. I was trying to persuade him to go in this time. He said, no, I think I've seen enough, thank you very much, having been halfway down the tunnel and got stuck, and then uh, came back out again. So it's, it's quite an entrance. And inside... The photos look really, really quite impressive. So that's what you can see going into it. And people talk about this being sort of kind of like an alien spaceship. The thing you need to bear in mind, it looks absolutely nothing like that when you go into it. It's pitch black. You have a head torch on. You can't see very much. It's 237 metres long. This is on a very long exposure on a camera, which is the reason you can see it at all. Now, when I went into it last week, it had camera lights up. So it was a bit more lit up, but even so, you could see where the camera lights were and everything else was just kind of pitch black behind. Now, it's, it's a really unusual and peculiar place. It was built in the run-up to World War II, and it was built to hold shipping oil. And it was built to hold shipping oil to protect it from German bombing. And one of the reasons it's incredibly reverberant 
is because they made it really out of really thick concrete. So basically it's sandstone, then they put shuttering in and they pulled it half a metre thick of concrete in front of the stonework. So it's a really heavy duty kind of construction. There are actually six of these side by side, one of which is a little bit smaller, but five are the same size as this one here. Um, so one of the reasons it's very reverberant is the wall's incredibly solid. In a construction you would never do, because they made it this way, because if the Germans did find out about it, and started to bomb it, they wanted to make sure it was secure. So even though it's still buried in the mountainside, they still made out of incredibly thick concrete so it survived bombing. The Germans naturally didn't bomb it, they didn't know it was there. So it was amazing, amazing huge complex constructed in secrecy the Germans never found out about. So when I first went in there, um, which was a couple of years back, I wanted to get the world record. And so therefore I took a me measurement for those with acoustics, I made a measurement according to ISO 3382, so I've, made, I've mentioned ISO, I feel I've done my Acoustics London branch meeting now. Um, so anyone who knows that standard, I, I took a starting pistol and fired it and made a measurement. So let me play the starting pistol and you can maybe guess the reverberation time. Now, it's, also, it's dropped into the air conditioning there, but the recording is actually about 70 seconds long. So in a quiet room, that will keep going for 70 seconds. And actually, when I recorded it, um, when I looked back and analysed it in octave bands, I actually realised I stopped it too early. It had dropped below my threshold of hearing at 125 hertz. It was still going. We hadn't reached the background of the place. There is no noise in this place. I mean, it's, it's a sealed cavern. You know, people talk about anechoic chambers being quiet. There is no noise in here at all, apart from what you make. It's in, it is immensely quiet. Um, so, unfortunately, I, I, it could have been even longer. Someone said to me, you should have recorded it for another 30 seconds. What a shame I, I never did. But uh, that's, the, that's the kind of impulse I measured. And uh, that's the certificate. So you can see the reverberation time. That's 75 seconds is actually what the record was. So the old record was 15 seconds. The new one is 75. Now, you'll notice the record is for the longest echo. And I've had many emails saying it's not an echo, it's reverberance. I do know it's reverberation. I tried to tell Guinness that they got the wrong term. <laughs> they didn't change their mind, it's still called the longest echo. So whenever I write about it, it's always in inverted commas, which really annoys me. Um, they basically had an old record for the longest echo and they wanted me to break it. Therefore they kept the name, even though it's technically the wrong term. Uh, so anyway, there we go. Um, and uh, if you want to look at the impulse response, it's incredibly diffuse. It's like, you, if you stand there with a gunshot, uh, so we were sort of 100 metres apart from that gun when it was fired. You can feel the diet sound go past you, you hear it slap off the back wall, come forward, and then it's just wash all the way around you. It's like someone's just turned the wet on a reverb. There's nothing else, much else in there. And you can see the density reflections really high right from the start. The other feature, I mean, it just looks like an impulse response, but notice this is 80, milli this is 80 seconds on the scale. So it's, it's, it's an, it does look like a normal impulse response, but it's rather, rather souped up. If you prefer to have it in decibels, there's in decibels. This is the 125 hertz octave band. You can see I stopped recording too early. It's still going. There's no background noise I've hit yet. So um, unfortunately I didn't go for long enough, but that was, uh, I didn't realize, I couldn't hear it. So obviously this microphone is more sensitive than my hearing is, um, which is a bit of a shame, but there we go. Um, and uh, if you want to say, for those who are in acoustics, is it diffuse? Here's the Schroeder curve, backwards integration. It is incre incredibly linear. They are all incredibly linear, all frequencies. So it's an incredibly diffuse space. And there you go, uh, 1,000 hertz, 28 seconds. Um, it's very frequency dependent, the reverberation time. And there's the curve for you to look at. So um, up at 4,000 hertz, the reverberation time is about 10 seconds, if I remember rightly. Up at 125 hertz, it's getting up to about, that's two minutes on this go. Uh, and at 63 hertz, it's well above two minutes, it's nearer three minutes, probably. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have a full decay to do the, the 63 hertz. It is higher than that, uh, almost certainly, but that's all the measurement I had, all the data I had. So I don't tend to show the left-hand side of that curve. You can see the error bars were a bit big, and I don't tend to show it. So it's a very, very different reverberation time at high frequencies and at low frequencies. At the 4,000 hertz, this is all air absorption. So this losses in the air as the sound passes from air molecule to air molecule. The sort of effect that you only worry about when you do outdoor sound propagation. You don't normally worry about it indoors, but this space is quarter of a kilometre long, don't forget. It's about 20, 50 metres wide and 50 metres tall. So you have to worry about air absorption. 
So you can use one of Keith's models for air absorption or something in there. So t this is, you can't probably beat this thing unless you were to get dry the air in the room, because that's purely air absorption. The walls are doing very little there. Down here, the air absorption isn't important, and it's all to do with the fact that the walls are incredibly hard. And in fact, someone tweeted um, immediately afterwards, I just put it in Sabine's formula, and the, uh, the, the can't, I can't predict these numbers. So here we go. Uh, so the red is the, uh, the measured you just saw. I've got rid of the 63 hertz. And the blue is a prediction using Sabine. It doesn't matter which RT formula you take. So at high frequency, you can do it quite well because it's all about air absorption. At low frequency, you get nowhere near. And the reason is, is when you normally look up in tables for absorption of concrete, it's normally a slab, which is, I don't know, that say thick. It's not half a meter thick, shuttered onto sandstone rock. So the absorption of these walls is much, much lower. And that's one of the reasons I think this world record might be very difficult to beat. Because where else would you get such a ridiculously over-the-top construction? So it's, sure, there's bigger places. There's bigger gas containers, probably. But they're probably metal walls. They're probably not made to be bomb-proof. And okay, nuclear bunkers are probably big spaces. But why would you have such a big single space in a nuclear bunker? You would obviously have lots of different sections to it. So it's a very unusual space, and I, I don't know of anywhere. And if you know of anywhere else, I'd be really interested to know, because uh, I'd love to go and measure it. So this is the extreme reverberation. One of the problems I had with Guinness was they wanted one number. They wanted a broadband reverberation time. So how do you average between 10 seconds and 2 minutes? You know, it doesn't make any sense to average it. It's so frequency dependent. So I said to them, can we quote the 125 hertz value? It's the biggest number. It looks impressive. And they said, no, we want a single number. So I did a broadband estimation, though it really, it, it, it didn't, I didn't like it. That's what the Schroeder curve looks like. It's incredibly bent because, of course, it's, the reverberation time varies so much across frequency. And I fitted it, and that's when I got my, my 75 seconds. So that's, that's when I got my record. Now, if you want to break that record, all you need to do is go into that space and take a bigger gun. Because, because it's, it's about, because they wanted a single number, if I, you excite more 63 hertz, it'll have a longer reverberation time, and therefore you'll get the record. So that's my recommendation for you. Get a very big gun, convince someone to take you in there, and you can have the world record and beat me for the same space. But Guinness weren't, weren't happy with me pointing out that the record was slightly flawed. Um, there we go. Now, last week I went into, the, into it again, and I wanted to play you uh, a bit of the sound that I got from there. So this is shot on a mobile phone, and I'll play you first of all. So this is me just starting a little piece. I'll then describe what it's like as a musician playing, and I'll play you a little bit more of it. So when you listen to this piece, I think the odd thing is the way that extra notes seem to kind of emerge. You might have heard that a bit in that archway, where you suddenly had me playing, and suddenly, oh, well, these are extra high notes appearing. You get this kind of effect in here. So it's also a really abrupt edit at the beginning and end, at the end, I think, in this. I literally got sent this this morning, so I've not edited it down. Uh, so this is me playing the alto saxophone in the Inch and Dan Oil Depot. Right at the end. So um, there's all these extra tones which seem to be emerging. Where do they come from? They are, it's all just me. There's no other musician that's just me playing. You can hear the occasional footsteps. It's very hard. It's, it's covered in puddles and oil. It's really horrible to work in. And uh, so every time you use your foot, like, shrunk, shrunk, and we had to retake the, the thing again because um, a lot of it had footfall noise in it. Um, so what's it like playing? Well, the first thing which is really peculiar is if you play a low note, you play a note, and the room just kind of echoes. It's, you play a low note, it's more like a ship has gone past, you know, going, Mah! as it goes past. It's quite an amazing kind of sound effect. But the odd thing is, as you play, is you can hear that piece was in phrases. It's, uh, it's actually a, a flute piece, as Keith was pointing out. It's a Debussy flute piece. Um, and you get to the end of a phrase, and you can hear this sound washing around, and you're thinking, I've got to play another set of notes, but they don't really go with what's happened before. Because the harmonies have changed. I mean, Debussy never wrote that to harmonise over several minutes, obviously. Um, 
Uh, and so what do you do? Well, I just carried on playing. I didn't quite know what to do at that point. So you play, it's quite odd, you get this sort of dissonance picking up. It's quite odd as a player to think, this next phrase doesn't really go, well I'll have to go with it anyway. Um, so it was quite fun to play. We only had a few minutes to play in it. Um, and um, so I'm going to finish on another little pit. So you can listen out for that dissonant fog, which is in the background. It tends to be low frequency, even though we've got titular little speakers you can't hear it. Because the very long reverberation time, it tends to be the rumble that stays around. You can listen out for that for whatever we get out of these loudspeakers. Um, and I'm going to play the end of the tune, although the person who happily gave, sent me the video chopped off with before, about two notes from the end. So I apologise for that. But you can also see what it was like actually playing in there. So, um, of course, you have to wear a hard hat to be on television. This is 15 metres high, but they wanted me to wear a hard hat because it's so dangerous and it's on television. Uh, and I'm afraid when you watch this video, the camera crew in front. So this is just a mobile phone shot in the distance. So listen out for those extra tones emerging. Listen out for the struggle of what to do for the next phrase. And listen out for the rumble. I'm sorry, it's a very abrupt end, but uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Trevor. That was fascinating. Yeah, it'll be out on Channel 5 in September, Underground Britain it's called, and maybe they will edit it a bit better when they do the final TV edit, but that's all I had from this morning. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, Trevor, you didn't actually tell us what the shape of that oil depot tunnel is. You said it was 200 and something metres yeah, long. Yeah, I haven't got cross section. Yeah, I didn't really give it a. The picture I got in this talk wasn't. It was only down the pipe. Let's see if it looks. No, you can't see. Sorry, I, I, I've got bit. There's other pictures which show it better. It's an arch shape. Ah. So it is tunnel like. It's 237 metres long. And it's about, if I remember, 15 metres wide and about 15 metres tall. It's got a bit of an arch at the top, which we assume used for construction, or construction reasons for, for sort of support and in case it got bombed, I guess, was why, why they made it an arch. Um, what else you're seeing in there as well is it's got puddles of oil all over the floor. So whatever you take in there is going to get trashed with oil if you're not very careful. My saxophone did survive. I was very nervous. Um, I did take my cheaper sax for that reason. And then all this metal work is actually heating pipe. So that's the only thing in there. It's because it's shipping oil, so it was very viscous shipping oil. It needs to be warmed up to move, especially in Scottish winters, I imagine. So it has to be warmed up to get it moving. So that's all the heating pipe work, which no longer it works. It's all taken to pieces. It was decommissioned in the 1990s, so it's not in use anymore, obviously. Oh, there's just one at the back. Hold on. Uh, the dome that you did the recordings on the top of, um, on you know, on the top of the tower. Tufelsberg, yeah, the yeah, listening station, yeah. How large was that, sort of a... It's about 15 metres across, so it's not, I mean, it's, uh, it's relatively small. I mean, St Paul's Cathedral is about 30-odd metres, so it's about yeah. half the size of the dome of St Paul's Cathedral. Oh, cool. But, I, I mean, I had no way of measuring it. I was on holiday, I had a little digi recorder, so I just stood and went, it looks about 15 metres. That's about as accurate as I know. Um, there's, a, there's an even better spherical room. If you want to get a spherical room, if you're in crossing Boston, go to the Maparium. I've not been to it. William Hartman has written in, the, in JASA in one of their papers about the acoustics of the spherical dome, uh, spherical globe. It's a globe of the world you go into the middle of, and it's got the most incredible acoustics. It's a complete, a complete sphere. Sorry, who's next? Uh, hi, is there a danger if, um, if acoustic consultants got their hands on every single building, would they design out all the interesting stuff and we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't end up with, you know, all these kind of 
extraordinary uh, places. Well, you spend, yeah, you, you must spend your life going, oh, architect wants to make a dome, what do I do about it? And, uh, uh, for those who don't know, I, my original research is diffusers, so I designed diffusers to go into, be placed on domes to stop focusing effects, I've done that. Um, one of the fun things I did in the, in the book was I turned it round. So these, if you take these modelling techniques, you saw the fine difference time to make, you can turn it round and say, okay, what would make the most extraordinary sound effect that you can do? So I, I did a simulation of a staircase. I don't know if you know staircases chirp, if you find the right ones. Uh, there's a very famous one uh, across in uh, it, it, Mayan Temple where you clap your hands and it chirps like a, a bird back at you. And there's lots of debates in archaeoacoustics about whether it was done deliberately and all this kind of thing. But that's just an evenly spaced set of stairs. If you do like the musical road, you space the steps that are uneven. You can make all sorts of things. So I made one which wolf whistled on my computer, which I thought was quite funny. So you can make a wolf whistle staircase. So you could have lots of fun. But I don't know if you'd ever get an architect interested. But you could have lots of fun. Maybe a sound artist would be more, more likely to be interested. Anyone else? Okay, can we thank Trevor for... Come along today. Thank you.